Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Stefan Graeber. That's Christian Brunner. We work at Canonical on the LexD team. Um, we also are behind the LXC, LXCFS projects, and uh, been doing a, some amount of kernel work in the container space for a while. Um, today, we're going to be looking at uh, making containers safer. And both some of the things we've done in the past, kind of what our use cases are, and also um, how to move forward and you know, what still needs to happen to make them that much, that much better. OK. Um, so first of all, like, yeah, I'll see if I can move that a bit, sorry. Let's, maybe if I point it up, that might work better. Testing. Yeah, seems a bit better. Cool. All right, um, so why do we care about safe containers? Um, I mean, not everyone does. Um, clearly, we do. Uh, in our case, we've been working on containers um, for over a decade. So the LXC project, which is the, the original um, Linux containers uh, project using the mainline kernel for, for containers, that's been around over a decade. LXD itself has been around about five years now. Um, those two really focus on system containers. So our goal is to run unmodified Linux distributions. We are not trying to run like single applications or like particularly tailored workloads. We do really care about running perfectly standard Linux distro as you find it anywhere else. Um, for LXD specifically, we really very much focused on getting you the same kind of uh, primitives and um, usability as a virtual machine. So the user doesn't really know, like once they get a shell inside that container, would that they are in a container or on this an actual virtual machine. It's not really visible to them. The only really visible thing is that it's using a shared kernel. Um, in such an environment, um, like we, we care quite deeply about security because some people might actually want to give SSH access to those containers to so different users that might run untrusted binaries, that might do a lot of weird things. Um, as a result, we've been focusing on, on security for both LXC and NXT for a long time. Um, we are using pretty much every tricks available. Uh, LexD defaults to and previous containers using user namespaces. We use the DLSMs, we use C groups, we use um, like fancy custom second policies, um, pretty much anything you can think of, we're doing it. Um, and we are working pretty hard, uh, both in user space and kernel space, to just Im make it much easier for people to run whatever they're normally doing inside such and privileged containers. Um, our goal is that like, privileged containers should just not be a thing, uh, and we want people to be able to use our containers just like they would a virtual machine and not have to care about uh, a neighboring container affecting them. Um, so I said we, we run unmodified distros, and we run quite a bit of those. Uh, we do run um, support running your standard Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, Fedora type things. We also support running Android and OpenWRT and some of the other less common Linux. Um, we actually build a lot of those images. We've got them available on our image server. They're updated daily. So we, right now, we build 18 different distros, uh, 77 different releases, uh, or about 300 different images every day, because we also build on six, six different architectures. Um, we've got hundreds of thousands of active users um, that are using those images, like creating new containers or operating the existing containers every day. We also on all Chromebooks. Um, LexD is used behind the uh, Linux, ap Linux application feature on Chromebooks. Um, it's available on all new Chromebooks at this point and available on a number of older Chromebooks as well, um, so long as they support the right features. Um, for Chromebooks specifically, it's interesting. Um, the way it's set up, uh, they are using both virtual machines and containers. So they are starting a per-user virtual machine using cross-VM. And then inside that virtual machine, they've got effectively a read-only um, Linux system with, uh, which runs LexD um, with some persistent storage uh, that's right about attached to that VM. And then LexD runs uh, unprivileged containers. They actually contributed code to, to our project to make it impossible to create uh, privileged containers in any way, shape, or form. And it's very well integrated with the, the rest of the um, Chrome OS platform. Um, they support uh, GPU pass-through, USB pass-through, access to sound card, 
um, sharing files, um, triggering snapshots and backups directly from the, the Chrome OS interface, and uh, applications installed inside those containers will just seamlessly integrate with the, the Chrome OS system. So that's kind of why we care. Uh, we've got you know, all of those users um, on various distros all trying to run um, whatever they feel like, like any normal workload they would normally run inside a virtual machine, they would just run it inside a container, get much, much increased density. Um, but like some of the, the words I just used might have been a bit confusing, so maybe we should just take a step back and kind of go through some of the terminology around there. Um, I did mention privileged containers and privileged containers. Uh, you might also have heard rootless containers before. That's also a thing. Um, then you've got the, the user space definition of some of those is also kind of quirky. Um, Docker, for example, has a privileged flag, which doesn't mean that it's unprivileged normally. It just means that it's privileged privileged when you pass it. Um, and you've, you also have containers that, like the definition of what a container is is always kind of odd. Like, how many namespaces do you need to use for it to be a, an actual container? Do you need to use C groups? Do you need to use LSMs? Do you need to use capabilities? Um, it's because there's no such thing as a container in Linux. That's purely a user space thing. Um, we can't just say, oh, you're running inside a container, you're safe. But you also can't say that, oh, you're running inside a container, therefore you can't be safe. Like, it, it really matters on how exactly you've set things up. Um, so just to try and differentiate at least the two main kinds. Um, first of all, you've got your privileged container. Privileged container, at least in our definition, I think everyone can agree on that one. It means that root in the container is real root. There is no um, translation going on or anything. Um, it is running with real, like if you've got a process running in that container, it's running with real root privileges. Um, that's sadly what's used by the vast majority of containers out there. Um, most Docker containers, most containers running on Kubernetes are privileged containers. Um, the security story for those pretty much entirely relies on properly configured uh, LSMs, capabilities, seccomp, uh, extra privilege dropping, um, wherever possible to try and prevent any of those workloads from either ever getting root access, or if they need to run as root, having as limited a root user as possible so that they can't escape. Um, it's, they are very easy to create. Uh, anyone can create those containers very easily with just a few shell commands, uh, but it's extremely dangerous if you've done it wrong, and people have. Um, our personal stance for LXC and NXD is that privileged containers are not root safe and cannot be root safe. Um, we, like for a number of years now, we've well, actually for pretty much forever, we've effectively declined um, any report of a security issue against LXD or LXD that's specifically for privileged containers. We just don't call that root safe, and if anyone assumes root safety, it's, they're just gonna have issues. Um, we do our best effort to ship policies to block any potential holes we're aware of, but we also know that new holes are popping up in Linux pretty much every day, or every kernel release, and that it's a losing battle. That's why we've been focusing so much on the other class of containers, which are unprivileged containers. Obviously, those mean that root in the container is not root outside of the container. But then again, you've, you've got a bit of variety there as well. Because sure, you've got a mapped root user, so if you escape the container, you might be UID 100,000 with pretty limited privileges. Um, but what happens if you've got multiple one of those containers? Do you, all, do you want them all to tied to the same UID, and if you do and they can escape, then are you happy with one container being able to access the other? Maybe not. So you might also have unprivileged containers that have distinct, distinct maps, so either for the root user itself or for the entirety of the container. Um, in NextD, we call that isolated mode. If you turn that on, then every single container gets their own 65,534 uh, uh, UIDs and GIDs. Um, so that way, um, like if you can escape for some reason at least, we, there's literally nothing else running that you can try and own other than yourself. Um, 
but also it means that there is no um, DOS that can trivially be done, uh, which is not the case if you, if you forget to do that step because you might be able to set like a user limit on a specific UID inside your container and that will very happily apply to the same UID in another container. Um, that's not a new thing. Uh, people always talk about like, oh yeah, we might look into user namespace at some point, but like, it's been around since the 3.12 kernel. Like, we've had full support for it in LXC since that time. Uh, we've shipped Lex, the first LXC release we pushed out was uh, on an Ubuntu release that was shipping with the 3.13 kernel at the time. And it's been around a while, we, we understand it, it can be used, none of the semantics have really changed since. Um, yet we're pretty much the only ones using it. Um, one of the big issues for some of the other container runtimes is the file system aspect of this. Um, specifically, I mean, as soon as you run um, distinct uh, ID maps for every container, if they see a file coming from another container, it's gonna show up as the overflow UID. So it's gonna show up as minus one effectively, and you might not be able to read or write that data anymore. Um, it's fine for LXD containers because it is like a limitation that people understand and sure they can't attach a shared volume to two isolated containers. That's a restriction they can understand. The problem is when you look at something like Docker which uses uh, layers and those layers are then stacked on top of each other and then used as the root file system of different containers. That doesn't work because the layers themselves include UIDs and GIDs. There is a single copy of them on the file system. They are then layered, and then that's passed into the container. Um, if you use user namespaces, then everything on your inside the container shows up as the overflow UID. Um, we've actually done some work um, pretty recently to address those concerns, not specifically for Docker, because we're not working on Docker, um, but for the data sharing between isolated Lex like, containers. That work is ShiftFS, um, which is effectively an overlay file system that does uh, shifting of UIDs and GIDs across user namespace boundaries. Um, it's obviously dangerous if you set it wrong and you do it on slash of the host because then, hey, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but it's very useful if you set it up right as a way of sharing data between containers. It could also be used on top of a stack of layers to then allow for unprivileged application containers to work properly. Um, right now, that particular work is a distro patch in the Ubuntu kernel, um, mostly because the current approach is not considered to be really suitable for upstream. We are waiting to instead uh, add that feature to the new Mount API in the upstream kernel, where, which seems like a much better fit. Um, but we needed something quick, so we did something quick. Um, and maybe last thing to mention is uh, rootless containers, which is maybe another word you've, had, you've heard before. Um, that normally refers to what we were calling before fully unprivileged containers. So that's containers that not only are they unprivileged in the sense that they use a user namespace, but also they're unprivileged in the sense that they were spawned by a unprivileged user. Um, that's mostly possible. Um, like you can unshare a user namespace and set the other namespaces as an unprivileged user, that's fine. Uh, we've done that and supported it for years, nine in LXC. Um, the problem usually hit is if you want more than just your own UID, as UID zero inside the container, um, then you will need some set UID binary to set up more maps for you. Um, you can use the ones that come with shadow, so that's new UID map, new GID map, those are there, and they use the it's sub UID, it's sub GID files to control that behavior. Um, the other thing you're gonna run into is, hey, if you, how about networking? Like, do you want your own network interfaces? Because if you do, you can create them, but you, there's no way you can bridge them on the host side or configure them on the host side as an unprivileged user. So you need another set UID binary for that. Um, as a result, um, root test containers are somewhat limited use right now um, because you just end up having to pile up a whole bunch of set UID binaries, helpers everywhere to try and just do the pieces you need. Um, whereas most container managers just run as root on the host and then spawn um, children container that are unprivileged and if done right, uh, and there's no um, API access or anything from the container back to the host, then you don't really have a concern with doing that either. Uh, 
So I'm going to hand over things to Christian now. Cool. Uh, oh, that works. Sorry. I need to remember to keep this near my mouth. Um, so he talked about, uh, Stefan talked about privileged and unprivileged containers. And uh, one of the questions you probably have, or a lot of people have, is are they really that unsafe? <laughs> yes, they really are. Um, this is a list of uh, pretty bad CVEs that we had over time. And it's just against a single runtime, because as we said, we don't accept CVEs for privileged containers. Um, and 2019 actually started off with a pretty bad one. I don't know who remembers. CVE 2019-5736, which was a, a, a bunch of things at the same time. Uh, arbitrary code execution, container breakout, privilege escalation, whatever you want it to be. Uh, and one of the versions was essentially you tricked uh, the, um, the runtime binary into executing itself. It cached a file descriptor to that binary, and then it overwrote that binary. So when you re-executed uh, the container binary the next time, well, whatever the container wrote into that binary, you're now running. And that could do anything you wanted it to be. It was pretty bad. And there is a pretty interesting pattern, I think, to this. All of these attacks right here, um, you should double check. I'm claiming this right now, and I looked at all of them, but I'm not complex. If I missed something, I'm sorry. But all of these CVEs should not have been possible if you've used in privileged containers, so if you use user namespaces. CVE 2019-5736, not possible with unprivileged containers. And all of the other ones wouldn't have been possible, too. So this really matters. And uh, we can't, as Stefan uh, pointed out, we can't really guarantee that there aren't any exploits out there against privileged containers. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, if Jan were to look at, uh, at the ptrace code close enough, it would be pretty easy to find a bunch of other ones, uh, too. Actually, there was a recent one, right, for ptrace as well. Yeah, so there's a bunch of holes uh, in there. So privileged containers uh, matter. Um, and we're in a state where you can actually use them for a lot of different stuff. Uh, and so this is about making containers safer. And one of the things that should be fairly trivial, but is actually not, is make use of all of the existing solutions that are out there, which means all of the security features that we currently have, you should use them. And often, when you look at, uh, when you look at security issues, you see, OK, this is not really so much a problem of there is no mechanism that would block this. It's, it's a matter of it's a feature hasn't been used multiple reasons, I don't know, sometimes too complicated to understand, not well enough documented, that's obviously on, on, if it's a kernel feature, it's on us, on kernel developers who haven't documented it sufficiently. Um, uh, but yeah, you should, or one should definitely use them. Um, namespace, I'm not going to go th and explain to you what a container is, I'm just going to give some general guidelines before diving into, uh, into new features uh, that we've currently seen. Uh, namespaces, uh, we have a bunch of them, seven I think, and too few namespaces are often used. So if you look at the application container world out there, if you look at especially HPC workloads out there, it's oftentimes people are like, oh, I, I just want to do a mount namespace and then still run untrusted workloads in there. And that basically means you have problems. Um, it's, trivi it's trivially to go and do break out of this. And uh, all of the namespaces usually have some sort of security benefit. Network namespace, I think I don't need to explain that. User namespace, mount namespaces, and so on. It isolates the system in some sort of way. Uh, the most obvious one is uh, the user namespace. This is something we keep coming back to as well, because it's the only namespace that is concerned with isolating privileges on a standard Unix system, so capabilities per user namespace, UIDs, GIDs, translations, and so on. And um, yeah, for sure, it's a clunky API. There is nothing, uh, we, we can't have debates about that. Um, multiple people have pointed out we should probably make it nicer in some way. It's just a matter of uh, who does it and how how to make it nicer. Um, there is, there, for example, there are issues about how you uh, create namespaces at container setup time. I think there is an ordering issue with the uh, uh, user namespaces and network namespaces. Uh, if I remember correctly, and this hasn't been fixed, then you can create a clone a new container process with specif by specifying user namespace and network namespace at the same time. Because then all of your network, uh, I think your network devices are not owned by U root UAD0 uh, in your new user namespace. So you need to create the new user namespace, and then you need to unshare the network namespace, and so on. That's obviously, obviously stuff that probably should have, should have been done by the kernel, uh, but it's been outsourced to user space. So that's, that's something people run into, or have run into. 
Um, and also, uh, I think a big issue currently is you can't atomically set an S to all namespaces of a process, so you have to do it iteratively, uh, each single namespace. Um, I have some ideas, which I think I proposed on the mailing list a while back on how we can actually make this work. Now we have the infrastructure to actually do this. Um, but yeah, use all of the namespaces. Um, Obviously, uh, the two big topics uh, are SecComp and uh, LSMs. Um, SecComp is essential for privileged containers, obviously, uh, because you can trivially break out of a container if you allow uh, any syscalls, uh, if you allow a certain class of syscalls. Open by Handlelet, uh, for example, um, is pretty good. It allows you to traverse back to host root if it's on the same device, right? Um, it was a CVE in 2014. Well, no, actually it was a CVE against OpenVZ, right? So it's pretty, pretty old. Yeah, it was originally that there was a CVE of an, uh, against OpenVZ uh, for that particular attack, and that was then also affecting um, Docker. That was the shocker exploit vulnerability that, at the time, um, which, yeah, if, if you were not on a dedicated mount for the container, right. you could traverse back to the host and then Potential, like if your parent was slashed, then you can go and modify its C password, its C shadow, or whatever you want because you're still root. So, pretty bad. Right. So, I'm just going to gloss over this. So, for privileged containers, it's pretty essential. Uh, you probably need to maintain a whitelist, uh, not a blacklist. <laughs> there is not a, there's not a lot of, whole lot of uh, syscalls. Well, there's a bunch of syscalls that are safe, but uh, you probably want to block more than you want to allow. For unprivileged containers, you usually get, uh, get along with a, uh, with a blacklist. Um, we still use it uh, in unprivileged containers because it's nice for syscall blocking, obviously for legacy syscalls, uh, logging what syscalls as container has been performed, or um, it's a new feature I'm going to be talking about in a little bit, uh, the syscall interception stuff, uh, or to deal with broken user space. Uh, it's pretty nifty, actually. Um, going to come back to SecComp in a bit. Uh, and obviously LSMs, uh, I don't need to talk about LSMs quite a lot, I think, at the Linux Security Summit. There's going to be an update as well, uh, I think. Um, essential again for unprivileged uh, for privileged containers. Uh, there is a, a lot of files in ProcFS and SysFS that you definitely don't want the, even a privileged container uh, to be able to read. Uh, they are all block blocked in unprivileged containers, so by virtue of user namespaces. Um, so you need LSMs to block access to a bunch of files. Um, and the most frequently used, of course, SE Linux, App Armor, there are a bunch more. Load Pin, Tom Yoy's Mac. Uh, new safe set ID, which I'm going to mention in a little, in a little bit. Um, we use them in, or in, one can use them in unprivileged containers as well because more security, uh, but there's actually no real need, I think. Um, yeah, so let's talk about a, a couple of new features that landed recently and stuff that is planned uh, that makes containers hopefully a little safer. Uh, yeah, so one of the bigger things is uh, SecComp. Um, Notify target or uh, uh, outsourcing decisions of what syscalls sys sys are going to be successful or not to user space. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, I don't know how many people have heard of this. It's been landed in 5.0. Yeah, okay, a bunch of people heard of it. Case, have you heard of it? <laughs> um, so it, it, the nice thing is it allows uh, uh, running privileged containers, unprivileged containers with even less privileges. It's also pretty helpful for privileged containers, to be honest. Um, you can grant very fine-grained privileges. Um, and what you do, or what this feature ex essentially is, is uh, if a task loads a second filter, it can get a file descriptor to that second filter, um, and then it can send that uh, file descriptor to a more privileged other, like different users' process, users' based process recently, uh, usually. And uh, that file descriptor is pollable. Um, so you get an event when a syscall, a relevant syscall, which you have registered in your second filter, um, and then you can read uh, the actual syscall arguments, well, you know, uh, the integer arguments. Um, and then the privileged user space process can inspect these arguments. It can also inspect uh, in a race-free way. I'm not going to go into details how this is possible. The memory of uh, that syscall, so you can also uh, do the work of parsing out, uh, parsing out paths and so on. Um, and then if it decides, okay, the syscall is safe to make, uh, perform that syscall in lieu of the container, meaning it does all of the work that usually the kernel would do which sounds really nice, but it's also problematic because it means you need to make sure that you assume 
sufficient, uh, like a sufficient amount of credentials of the tasks you're performing the syscall in lieu of, while at the same time not assuming the ones that block you from doing so. Um, that's that's pretty annoying, to be honest. And but we think there might be a solution to do this better. We use it, for example, to intercept MakeNot. So uh, dev console, dev null, dev zero, dev random, dev u random are usually devices that you are fine with delegating to unprivileged containers as well. And container managers right now just bind mount them from the host, but there is no reason to actually do this. But I get why the kernel doesn't want to maintain a list of devices that are safe to create. So you can register a, a, a second filter that specifies, okay, if, if it's a make not syscall for these devices identified by the device number, please send me a notification. Um, then you have a privileged user space process, a container manager, in this case, like Steve, for example. It reads, uh, reads the syscall arguments, looks at it, looks at the syscall, uh, device number and finds out, okay, this is def null, yeah, whatever, I'm going to create the device node for you, then assumes the credentials of the process that is doing the syscall in lieu of, is doing the make node for it, and you're done. Uh, so this is obviously a pretty powerful mechanism. You could intercept mount, you could intercept what, whatever you want. You just need to be very, very careful that you obviously that you're doing it right and that you don't create devices that you don't want to create. Um, but yeah, that's a pretty nifty feature. So uh, one of the things obviously is, um, so for MakeNot it's not an issue. If let's say, for example, I register a filter and I say, give me all uh, MakeNot syscalls. Uh, indiscriminately, right? And I intercept a bunch of make not sys calls that uh, match devices that I uh, that I would want to allow, and a bunch of that those that I wouldn't want to allow. Um, if I intercept all of them, it doesn't really matter because make not and username space, spaces is not uh, is not possible to Coelho. So there, I mean, there is no device that you can create in the username space. Um, so if you hit a bunch of sys calls that would otherwise That's succeed. Not true. Typos. Huh? You've got some. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Any interest in character devices and block devices. Right, but okay. we, we, I was we, implicitly we, we actually that. had that right. issue at the beginning in Next Day where we were intercepting all it's of the enough. make note calls, and that was causing problems with things right. that were not character or block devices. Um. Exactly. So, but if you, if you want to intercept uh, differences calls, uh, that would partially succeed in, uh, in unprivileged containers uh, for some arguments, but not for others, then you obviously have a problem because right now you might intercept the ones that you could, uh, that you can do in lieu of the container that would otherwise fail, uh, but all of the other ones that would usually succeed, you now need to do them as well, which is again pretty tricky in so far as assuming the right credentials and so on. So what would be pretty nice um, if we could somehow tell SECOM to resume a given syscall, like for example, you intercept a syscall, you inspect the, you inspect the arguments, and you as a user-based process, especially if you manage a container or another process, you usually will know when a syscall will succeed. Uh, you can tell. And then you're like, oh, please, kernel, go ahead with the syscall. Uh, um, and yeah, would be pretty good if we, uh, if we had this. I think I sent the mail to the case summit discuss mailing list. It's a slightly notch case, no. But yeah, it's a, it's a discussion to be had because it's not easy, uh, it's not trivial to do, I think. Uh, but yeah, that's something we would really want. Exactly, the point, no raised privileges, I think the most important one. The execution just continues with the privileges of the original task. You don't need to mark with any permissions and so on. It would pretty, be pretty helpful. Um, and another one is extended syscall filtering. Uh, that discussion has been popped up quite a bit uh, over recent times. I think now it's even made it into a BPF thread that is currently going on. So um, we have a bunch of syscalls uh, that carry flag arguments, and these flag arguments are usually passed in registers, so they're readily available, and not as pointers, they're readily available for SECOM to, uh, to filter them. Pretty neat, traditional clone syscalls and so on. Uh, but at the same time, we have a bunch uh, that don't. And we have uh, new syscalls that maybe don't want to pass flag arguments as registers or in registers, but as part of uh, pointer arguments such as structs. Uh, the recent syscall that uh, we added was uh, the clone three syscall. The flags argument has moved into a dedicated argument struct. Uh, and we still would like SECOM to be able to filter uh, these arguments. 
Um, and uh, there's a dedicated discussion around this. Um, Andy Litomirski has made a, a proposal, I think, on, you can follow this mailing list thread, um, uh, has made a proposal on how to do this without eBPF or without bringing unprivileged eBPF into the game. And I think the common understanding is that we don't really want that to happen, unprivileged BPF, eBPF because of this feature. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be also, I think, uh, pretty technical, a pretty uh, difficult technical challenge to come around. Um, but it would be pretty neat uh, if we had this. Um, okay. Um, I probably don't need to say a lot about this, right? LSM stacking is going to be an update on Wednesday. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and um, what we would like to do is, if you have a Fedora host that runs uh, SA Linux, an SA Linux policy, you run a container with Ubuntu that uses AppArmor, none of the AppArmor policies that usually confine apps on Ubuntu would now be usable because you currently cannot stack, unless I'm wrong, uh, uh, AppArmor on SA Linux or SA, SA Linux on AppArmor. And uh, you currently can stack minor LSMs with major LSMs, so Tomio, LoadPin, AppArmor, and SLinux. This has been work, work that has been done recently, uh, but the ultimate goal, I think, is still uh, to stack uh, LSMs on top of each other. Uh, that would be pretty neat. Uh, would unblock a lot of use cases. Um, the safe set is safe uh, set ID uh, Linux security module that I recently stumbled upon that has been merged or is going to show up in 5.3, uh, which comes from the Chrome OS guys, uh, which restricts ID trans uh, transitions through set IDs. This calls given a uh, system wide policy, uh, which will probably be mostly useful for privileged containers. Um, you, because you can limit a container to a limited range of UIDs and GIDs, uh, so it's going to be pretty helpful for that. Uh, we, I don't think we have a particular use case in mind right now for us. And the mount API. Uh, this has been mentioned before. Uh, David and uh, Al have been working on this uh, quite a bit. Um, idea is use file descriptors for mounting, uh, for configuring, uh, setting up mounts and so on, split uh, one syscall that is heavily overloaded with multiple tasks at the same time into a bunch of syscalls. I think we have seven right now, but we need eight or, now, uh, eight or nine, um, and it's gonna, going to hopefully have a bunch of nice features such as uh, recursively applying mount options to a whole uh, mount tree, at least David is working on this. Um, it has anonymous mounts, which is a feature I've been wanting to have wanted for a long time, which means you can access a mount that you have configured and set up, but it is not attached to any path in the file system, uh, but you can still access files and so on. Um, and uh, it avoids numerous race conditions as well. Uh, you have been thinking about a good example before, right? Well, it was the, the usual risk, well, type oh. of risk conditions we've got during attach. So if you want to spawn a process inside a running container, um, you will need to pull some information from it, and you might, have some, like you might need access to proc to rewrite your LSM label or right. to do some other operations. But you can't trust proc inside of the map namespace of the container. Um, because the root in the container might have mounted like a tempfs and then pretended that things looked okay, or mount a fuse file system yeah. that pretends enough of proc that you think every, you think you're actually writing oh. an LSM label when you're not. There was a CDE um, for this as well. Yeah, where, where there were a number of, your file there were a number of issues around, around yeah. that for a number of container managers. Um, exactly. The way we do it right now is we we use uh, DRFDs. So we, we open proc as a DRFD on the host, uh, then we do the attach, and then we do everything relative to that DRFD. And that kind of works, but it's a bit of a pain. Right. Um, and it, being able to just hold FD on two particular mounts is going to make some of that much cleaner and, and easier for us. One of the things that uh, David has told me he's going to work on, uh, uh, which uh, I find pretty, it's a pretty good idea, is being able to uh, set up uh, ID shifting. This is uh, basically ShiftFS, which you mentioned before. Um, uh, there is some discussion going on whether it's supposed to be tied to a user namespace or it's going to be not tied to be a user namespace. But it would be pretty neat if you could say uh, map these IDs uh, for this and this mount, uh, and also to set the namespaces of a mount, which is a feature that is lacking in the current API currently. So to, like, often we inject mounts into a container across mount namespaces, and there is a whole lot of trickery involved to get this actually done. You can't just find mount it somewhere. 
um, because of how mount namespaces work. Uh, so if you could say, given the right privileges, inject this mount into this container, basically say these namespaces, uh, that would be pretty neat if that would work out. And one piece of work I should mention, and I didn't put on a slide, is work that's been done by a good friend of mine, Alexa. Uh, he's working on restricting path resolution on, uh, on uh, Linux uh, by proposing a new syscall open at two. Um, uh, that's, that would be pretty neat. The idea being that you attach a set of uh, a set of permissions to a file descriptor that you can then uh, later uh, escalate to more privileges. Like what you can do right now is you can open a file descriptor as read only, and then through proc and open at trickery reopen it as read write. Uh, and this API would uh, block you from doing this. Also, you could do nice features such as if you have a file descriptor, um, if you have a dear file descriptor to a, a root directory of a container, you can never walk uh, out of the container. It's always going to, resolution is always going to be relative to this dear FD. It forms the new root, essentially, of your system. Um, that's pretty exciting work. Uh, it's blocked on, um, yeah, it's blocked on L. Let's put it like this. Um, and yeah, uh, hopefully this is going to be landing, is going to land at some point soon in the future. This will be a big security improvement as well. Um, one thing we've also been working on, and I'm going to close with this, uh, not the keyring stuff. I think, well, keyring namespacing, that's what David's been working on as well. Uh, ultimate goal being to have keyrings be able to use the non-privileged containers so that shit network file systems can authenticate against the server with their own individual key and so on. A bunch of that infrastructure has landed in 5.3. I'm not sure if it's completely usable at this point in time, um, but the ultimate, ultimate goal is, uh, is to get it working. By the way, this was also his reason for proposing uh, containers as kernel objects at one point. Uh, apparently, he has abandoned this, this idea. Uh, and the last part is, uh, which we've used for our container manager, or are using for our container manager, it's using file descriptors for processes to eliminate a bunch of races that have existed on Linux for uh, quite a long time. Uh, there's been some work going on in this direction. Um, so uh, you, right now you can get a new file descriptor from clone with clone pitfd or from clone three with that flag said. Um, you can send signals through pitfd, send signals to those uh, file descriptors. You can get a PIDFD for an existing process with PIDFD open. You can also poll to get uh, exit notifications for non-child processes, which is pretty handy. Um, that obviously, if, for us, it because we have uh, spawn subdemons, right? Yeah. We spawn subdemons, uh, and uh, they usually have PID files, and then we parse out the PID of the PID file, and then we send a signal to that process, and so on. It's, uh, it's all racy, obviously, if that process exits and gets respawned with a different PID, but the PID that's in the PID file is reused, then you have obviously going to have a problem and so on. So this hopefully uh, eliminates a bunch of those, uh, a bunch of those problems, um, and there's more, more features I have planned or we have planned around this API. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. I think you want to do some closing words, Stefan? Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, like, despite the, the name of the talk, like, you know, making containers safer. Like, there's no, there's no one way of just making it happen. Um, it definitely depends on what you're doing. Um, what I would say is, like, try to not reinvent the wheel. Uh, there are a number of container managers out there that have gone through the, the pain of all of those issues and have figured out ways of doing it. Um, if you can, you can even use um, LXC as a library through uh, LibLXC to try and do some of that stuff for you so you, you don't risk hitting some of those uh, annoying kernel issues. Um, the one recommendation, obviously, and I think we've said it multiple times during this talk, is like do not use privileged containers. Like If you're not using the user namespace, you just can't make things safe. It's just people should really get, get to understand that and move as far away as possible from any kind of privileged containers um, because the security issues will keep happening. Like there's, there's really no way around it. Um, it's not something that we'll ever make safe, and there's really no reason for that either. Um, so yeah, that's it for us. I think we're kind of out of time, so I'm not sure that we can really do questions at this stage. We'll see. OK. Um, otherwise, we also have a bunch of stickers in front if people want to go and get some of those afterwards. Um, it's there. And questions?
have to switch on. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, the question is on the this notify feature of SecComp, right? That you are yep. introducing. How deep can you go? Suppose you have an inode in the system call. Can you enumerate all the passes for that inode? Can you, I don't know, go to the super block, get uh, the device underneath, uh, figure out whether that device is removable? How flexible uh, that user uh, analysis of the system call could be? It is, it is pretty limited uh, in the sense that what you get is um, you, you know what the task ID is, and you've got the pointers to the arguments. And that's all you get from user space. After that, normally what we'll do is we'll effectively, uh, and the th uh, thread itself is uh, temporarily frozen by the kernel while you're processing. Um, so user space can go and like duplicate the memory or some of the other properties yeah. of the the con of the process to try to analyze and. You can there, you but. can read the pointer arguments uh, by going through proc pid mem I think, and then also you have to, you can check there is a cookie that comes with each uh, syscall that is made. And then you can use that cookie and uh, check uh, whether um, it's still valid, like this, the task is still alive and it's, you're not operating on, on... Yeah, exactly. And so you read the memory, you can uh, do all of the anal anal yeah, analysis that you want, but it's, mm -hmm. pretty, it's pretty annoying, obviously, because it's, it's costly, it requires proc and so on, and the most important part, the most difficult part is really um, if you're a privileged process and you perform operations in terms of a less privileged task, you ha always have to assume like the privileges of the less privileged task, and that's really problematic because you need to be very, very sure that you uh, take all of the things in mind. Think about make not. You need to make sure that you're in the correct device C group in case uh, there is a device list, that device policy that blocks you from it. Uh, you probably also need to assume, the, like, if the process is cruited, you need to be attached to a mount yeah, namespace. Yeah, we, we had a lot of fun around uh, ch root, cwd, and mount namespaces to actually get all the right pieces in the right order so that we would be at the right spot, but also would still have enough privileges to actually do something. Because we could do it reasonably easily by also attaching to the user namespace, but then we effectively lost our privileges and we couldn't actually do the make node anymore. Um, and we even had other cases where like mounts that originate from each side of mount namespace are owned by root inside the namespace and therefore is yeah. automatically marked as no dev, so we can't actually create stuff in there. Exactly, like. so, I mean there's also, there's a bunch of other stuff, like as soon as you have a file system mounted uh, inside of the new mount namespace, you cannot uh, just simply create a device node in the original underlying file system because obviously there's something mounted above it and there is no way to create a device node for a, for a file system mounted from inside a user and uh, namespace because there's the SBI node flex set that prevents you from doing so. Details don't matter. So you need to inject mounts into the container if you want to have the device and it, it's all just really messy. Um, it's a pretty me powerful mechanism. It allows you to get rid of fake root. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, well, you encounter some uh, issues with uh, say comp uh, argument filtering. Uh, because obviously uh, filtering flags is easier, um, but uh, filtering pointers, well, it doesn't make sense. And that exactly is exactly the, the same issues I can encounter with uh, Lanlock. Uh, so, uh, Give it as you know, I use eBPF to try to make something with kind of pointer uh, to try to filter kind of object, because in fact, it's what you want to do. Um, so, uh, it'll be interesting to to know if you have some um, some lead to be able to filter an object without uh, the eBPF stuff uh, like I do with uh, Landlock. And if you ever um, thought about using uh, uh, or extending Nolock for your, your use case. I think there have been a couple of uh, have been a couple of proposals. Uh, uh, I think Andy made an idea of what was it? Uh, mark a bunch of syscalls as filterable, right? But that's something you really case really didn't like. He agreed. Uh, he agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's right now. It is, it appears to be a question of where to do it. Um, there's a we could either cache 
the arguments as they're coming in and test them in, in two places, or we can have it that analysis happening deeper at like the LSM level where you have to have a different idea of what the what the arguments are. I don't know. It, you're familiar with it too. So there's there's it's on the agenda for the kernel summit is to try to nail something down for this. So it, in essence essentially no concrete proposals yet. <laughs> it's it's a really I tried to hide the fact but no. Okay, uh, thanks for the talk. Thanks.